All right, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to do in this uh, segment is talk about uh, the control of gene expression, uh, specifically in eukaryotes. Now, we're familiar with uh, what operons uh, do for prokaryotes, but since uh, eukaryotes have a nucleus, uh, the separation of transcription and translation uh, allows for many other um, ways in which to control gene expression. So, um, again, it's a, a more detailed process, uh, such as the uh, editing of RNA that's involved uh, and other uh, means of control. So, uh, regulation of eukaryotic gene expression uh, will uh, be a bit more uh, detailed. So, uh, again, the key is separation, both uh, in time and location, of the events of transcription and translation uh, allow for a number of different ways in which uh, we can uh, influence the expression of genes. So we'll go through these individual steps uh, point by point here. Now, um, initially we're going to look at uh, whether or not the DNA can even uh, be accessed. So if we uh, look closely here, we see that uh, DNA, uh, or chromosomes if we will, uh, are wrapped around these little histone proteins. And uh, when that happens, uh, and the, the DNA is packed tightly around these proteins, the information or the, the bases uh, in the middle of the rungs are not accessible to RNA polymerase to transcribe the genes. So in that instance, the DNA is not able to be transcribed. Now, um, when the DNA is relaxed, uh, the bases are available then to the uh, ribosomes, I'm sorry, the uh, RNA, uh, to make the uh, messenger RNA transcript. Now this process occurs through uh, what's called acetylation. Um, Acetyl groups, uh, small little functional groups, are added to the histone tails, or the tails of these proteins uh, that are found in chromatin. And when that happens, it uh, again sort of neutralizes the charge between the tails and uh, the DNA relaxes a bit, okay? So you're able to get that information, or that uh, information in the bases. So uh, these two types of uh, genetic material are called heterochromatin and euchromatin. Uh, heterochromatin, hetero uh, obviously meaning different, so uh, it's unacetylated and the DNA is tightly packed. Euchromatin though has been acetylated, uh, so the DNA is more spaced out. Uh, so uh, again, it's about adding these acetyl groups. Okay. Uh, now we'll look at methylation. Uh, when DNA is not methylated, uh, again, uh, the histones uh, or nucleosomes, the, complement, or the combination of uh, DNA and histones, uh, they're more spread out. So if we look, oh look, along the black DNA there, uh, the genes are more accessible. Now, um, when methyl groups are added, you see how the space uh, between the nucleosomes here uh, significantly shortens. So that uh, condenses the DNA significantly, and again, uh, the information uh, within the DNA is not uh, available. Um, we talked about this uh, with X chromosome inactivation uh, last semester. We know that females have two X chromosomes, but one of them uh, is inactivated. Well, that X chromosome, X chromosome inactivation occurs through the methylation of DNA. We have these little methyl groups. The DNA uh, condenses or collapses on itself, and you, you, know, you wind up with a little speck inside the nucleus uh, that is the condensed chromosome. Uh, let's see, there are also uh, pre-transcriptional controls. Um, if we look at uh, this DNA, we're familiar with the you know, promoter gene sequence here, uh, but there are also portions of the DNA prior to or upstream of uh, the uh, genes of interest that have a role in RNA polymerase docking to the promoter and transcription actually occurring. So we call these control elements, okay? All it means is it's just an area of DNA upstream of the promoter and the gene um, that have a role in uh, transcription. And we can see this here. There's the promoter and the gene that we're familiar with. And here are these um, segments uh, upstream of the gene of interest. And there are little proteins, we call them activators, that dock uh, at these specific regions of the DNA, and then they work with uh, in concert with other proteins to help RNA polymerase attach to the promoter. Remember, the whole goal of all of this is to get RNA polymerase to attach to the promoter. And it just so happens that a lot of different elements are involved uh, in helping seat uh, RNA polymerase and beginning transcription. So 
um, you know, just uh, have the familiarity with recognizing the fact that you know portions of DNA and a number of different proteins work in concert to help begin transcription. Now, um, this is significant in the fact that, oops, excuse me. Sounds like a rock concert there. All right. Uh, so we know that um, we have these specific molecules that can dock to these uh, regions of the DNA. Now, the molecules that can dock uh, are called activators. And what's special is that different activators are going to be docking in different locations. So what's sort of cool about that is when we start off as uh, a single cell, a zygote, we have all these different molecules, all these different activators in that one cell. But when the cytoplasm begins to divide, you also randomly split up these molecules that wind up in each cell. So over time, uh, as uh, the embryo forms, um, the combinations of these molecules that wind up in various cells end up attaching to various parts of the DNA and ultimately wind up causing different genes to be expressed. So that is part of what causes uh, specialization in our cells. It's part of what causes us to go from being um, one generalized cell to trillions of specialized cells. Just by the random division of the cytosol and uh, its contents, uh, you wind up with some cells having certain molecules that cause certain genes to be expressed and other cells having other molecules that cause other genes to be expressed. Now another part to this is what's called induction, uh, where one cell that has specialized causes a neighboring cell to specialize uh, in the same way. And that also helps promote this differentiation uh, or specialization of cells into tissues. All right, uh, we're familiar with all sorts of post-transcriptional controls. Uh, last semester, we studied uh, the addition of the five prime cap and the poly A tail uh, after transcription occurs. Uh, so we know, you know that's part of the editing of RNA that occurs. Uh, there's also this alternative splicing. Uh, again, we know that um, when exons uh, are spliced together, Different combinations of exons can be put together in different ways to create all sorts of uh, mature messenger RNAs that can lead to a number of different proteins. So again, another, another way to control the expression of genes. Oops. Um, sorry, I clicked through there a little too quickly. Um, so we have some pre-transcriptional means of uh, impacting gene expression as well. And part of that is through these non-coding segments of RNA. Um, again, we know we've got billions of A's, D's, C's, and G's in our genome, um, only about one and a half percent of all those genes uh, get expressed uh, as proteins. And a lot of information uh, does not go directly into the production of proteins, and in some cases uh, goes into RNAs that control genes. One such case is uh, these little microRNAs that are produced. So sometimes you take DNA and transcribe it into a big messenger RNA like we see here. Well, then what can happen is this RNA gets cut into pieces. And these tiny little pieces then uh, will be single-stranded, ultimately. And what that does is allow these little snippets of single-stranded uh, messenger RNA, called the microRNAs, these tiny little pieces of uh, messenger RNA, can actually uh, base or base pair with pieces of RNA that have been transcribed. So imagine you've got these little snippets of RNA floating around uh, and then RNA, uh, messenger RNA that's released from the nucleus travels by hydrogen bonds uh, with the bases on this little snippet of microRNA. And what that does is in effect inactivates this messenger RNA. So this may have had the instructions for a particular protein, uh, but if it attaches to this microRNA, it is rendered useless. Okay? Uh, it can be uh, degraded or just not be able to be expressed uh, on the ribosome. So that is a definite means of controlling uh, production of proteins uh, after transcription has occurred. So uh, this video does a really nice job sort of summarizing the process. So we'll take a moment to go through and view that. Here's the DNA, the master code in 
inside the nucleus. DNA never leaves the nucleus. Ever be one of those mean librarians? You know, get special reserves section. You to go, wow. right? You can take the thing, you can copy it, but you can't take the book because somebody else might need it. So if DNA is locked in the nucleus, how do we get the information out to build our creature? Well, that's from copying recipes out of a cookbook and throwing them out the window, out to the cytoplasm seed that makes up most of the cell. All those recipes floating through the air, they are RNA. And to finish up in that seed, you see hundreds of thousands of, well, they may have been little guys with chef hats. Those would be ribosomes. And in your world, there are chefs who are using the recipes that are written in the RNA. And whenever a recipe lands on a chef, whatever it is, he cooks it. Whatever it is, he cooks it. And each recipe is for a protein. Proteins build cells, bone cells, brain cells, all cells. So all these chefs are basically building you. You are made of proteins. And the discovery of RNA was an accident, it was a puzzle, that appeared in a petunia. In 1986, geneticist Rich Jorgensen was working at a biotech startup company in California. He was asked to create a spectacularly dazzling flower. And so they decided to create a very, very, very purple petunia. Rich knew which gene produced purple. He knew how to sneak an extra copy of that gene into the plant's DNA and he mastered text to be copied by that monk-like scribe. It will be transcribed by the monk because the same as any other gene. And he'll throw the transcript out the window into the cytoplasm where the chef will be able to pick it up and then use it. Rich thought that if he added more purple recipes, he'd get a purpler petunia. So he did it and he waited. And what happened? We produce instead white flowers. White flowers? Quite opposite of what we had expected. Our initial reaction was that something must have been wrong with the gene that we had engineered and introduced to the plant. A mistake? A mistake. So we checked everything out, and there were no mistakes that we could find. The platoon was a big puzzle. Nobody understood why when you add an extra gene for purple, you should not get more purple, but less purple. It took a decade of Brilliant scientists working on petunias and fruit flies and worms and other organisms to finally work out what was going on. Quite by accident, Rich had discovered a secret inside living cells. Cells from time immemorial have had a mortal enemy called the virus. So let's imagine that the virus is a pirate ship. It lands. It then sends invaders inside the cell to shower recipes down to those books. The sole purpose of that virus is to make additional copies of itself to the point that the entire cell is filled up with this. The cell explodes, releasing these viruses to go and then infect whatever other cells they can find. So the theory is that long the little cells develop a secret defense system which we will call what the cop does is when viruses invade and create showers of murderous recipes, the cop looks and thinks, hmm, some of these have a very fishy shape. It's a chemical difference which comes down to some of the viral recipes are two pages instead of one, and one side is a mirror image of the other. But the point is, to the cop, there's something not right about this shape. So when they see in that shape, they say virus. They say, well, uh, uh -oh. and the cop destroys the recipe. Cells were able to tell that something was very funny when they saw mirror image messages and start not just destroying the messages, but destroying anything that looked like that message. They worked out this whole defense system against against viral RNA and may then accidentally stumble into the instrument. The question remember was when Rich tried to make his petunia more purple, why did it turn white? Well, the answer it turns out that the rich by accident discovered the cop. When Rich invaded the petunia cell and inserted his make more purple instructions, he didn't know it, but his purple instructions happened to have that suspicious viral shape. So when the cop saw the recipe, 